This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin. In this episode of the Onkizim Brief, I'm talking with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. In our program today, which was originally recorded in August 2020, we talk about the companies and the transformative therapies they have developed for patients diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that has come back or did not respond to previous treatment and who cannot receive a stem cell transplant. We also talk about a drug called Tavacitamab, which is branded as Monjuvi. This drug is the first drug in combination with lenalidomide, approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration for the second-line treatment of adult patients diagnosed with relapsed or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Tavacitamab is a humanized CD19-targeted monoclonal antibody. The drug was approved under accelerated approval based on overall response rate. Continued approval may be contingent upon verification and description of clinical benefit in a confirmatory trial. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma in adults worldwide. The disease, characterized by rapidly growing masses of malignant B-cells in the lymph node, spleen, liver, bone marrow, and other organs, is typically diagnosed in patients in their 60s. But that does not mean that younger patients may not get the disease. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is an aggressive disease, with about one in three patients not responding to initial therapy or relapsing soon thereafter. In the United States, each year approximately 10,000 patients are diagnosed with a disease who cannot receive a stem cell transplant. And that means that managing relapse or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma continues to be a challenge for the treating physicians and care team. Despite the treatment advances made over the last decades, approximately 40% of patients relapse or are refractory to chemotherapy with low subsequent response rate and an associated poor prognosis, poor health-related quality of life, and a loss of life expectancy of about 5 years compared with the general population. As a result, the disease represents a major medical need and researchers and scientists are continuing their quest in trying to find an optimal treatment option. The combination therapy, which includes tavacitamab, is expected to help reduce this medical need. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosine Brief. The Oncosine Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal Oncosine at oncosine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. For more information on how to support the program, visit our website at oncosine.com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Now, let's listen to our interview with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. With me on the phone are Peter Langmuir and Malte Peters. Uh, Malte Peters is Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir is Group Vice President Oncology Targeted Therapies at Insight. Welcome, gentlemen, to the Youngers in Brief. Thank you. Hello. So before we're going to talk about a new drug that uh, was recently approved by the FDA for the treatment of uh, relapsed and refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, let me ask you a question about how how are you guys doing with uh, the COVID uh, pandemic? I mean, not only yourself, but maybe your family, friends, your co-workers, uh, how are you guys coping? Yeah, thanks, Peter, for asking. Uh, This is Malte. Um, We are well um, at Morphosis. Um, We have offices in in Munich, in Germany, and in Boston, in the United States. Uh, Overall, uh, our uh, company is quite fortunate uh, that we do not have many um, uh, co-workers who have been affected uh, by uh, COVID. What's also um, very important for us is that our clinical trials um, have uh, fortunately been able to progress quite well. 
we are active in uh, cancer um, development, drug development, but also in, in autoimmune disease drug development. And uh, fortunately, um, our clinical studies have not been affected uh, too hard uh, by the corona crisis. So overall, we have uh, managed to go uh, to come through the crisis um, very well. And of course, we, uh, we, we hope that the corona crisis will be over soon uh, so that everybody can, uh, can get back to normal. Right. And I think the same is true for us at Insight. And I think we've, we're continuing to weather it as, as everyone else is uh, in our priority, uh, you know, similar to what uh, Malta said, is trying to ensure that patients continue to get the medicines they need, continue participation in the clinical trials, and ensure their safety on the trials, as well as ensuring the safety of all of our employees. So, yeah, we're continuing to weather it, continuing to monitor as it uh, evolves throughout the world. But um, so far, I think we're managing okay. Yeah, but that's, that's good to hear. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Now, you mentioned in, both of you mentioned clinical trials in, in the introduction there. I mean, when, when, when you look at, uh, watch TV, when you look, listen to the radio, often um, it seems that the only clinical trials that are being conducted are clinical trials in, 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 it, in finding a cure for COVID-19 or the coronavirus. How difficult is it for you um, in, in oncology dealing with, with uh, forms of uh, lymphoma uh, to, um, to, do, to recruit patients under these circumstances because patients need to come to a hospital? Uh, so how difficult is that? And, 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 and what have you tried to do to, to solve potential problems in that respect? Unfortunately, um, Peter, uh, the cancer doesn't stop uh, because of um, the coronavirus. Um, so the, the incidence of uh, cancer diagnosis um, across all indications uh, has remained uh, constant before and after the corona crisis. And uh, patients do need uh, urgent treatment if they are diagnosed uh, with cancer as much as they did uh, before the pandemic. So what's more difficult is on the level of the hospitals, to ensure that the, that the hospital staff manages all the different additional work that falls upon them um, with respect to um, uh, dividing their time between the corona patients and uh, cancer patients. But so far, I think the hospitals we are working uh, with have done an excellent job in ensuring that patients with urgent need of immediate uh, treatment for cancer uh, get the treatment they need. But that, that is definitely good news. Indeed, um, cancer does not stop uh, because of a pandemic um, and, and, and patients need to be treated. It, it made life for everybody involved probably a little bit more difficult, uh, but it is good to know that I mean, there is an ongoing pro process in which um, we be able to kind of uh, treat patients. That's, that's always a good thing to know. Now, let, let's um, talk a little bit about uh, the drug um, tafacitamab uh, that was approved by the FDA um, earlier in this year on July the 31st. It's a drug that is a combination therapy, um, and it's for relapsed and refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Before we go on to talk about the drug itself, tell me a little bit about the disease area. What is a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma? Um, how often does it appear, happen? How common is it? Um, what causes is it? I mean, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so maybe I start um, and uh, say that if you are working um, as a doctor in the hospital and a patient uh, comes to the hospital suffering from diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, that's a medical emergency. So uh, people with this diagnosis require immediate uh, treatment and it's a life-threatening disease. So um, patients need, need immediate uh, treatment and the hallmark of this particular form of uh, cancer is that the, the tumor cells multiply uh, very rapidly. So it's a very aggressive uh, disease. So that's why the treatment that has recently approved Monjuvi in combination with uh, lenalidomide is such an important uh, new aspect of treatment. And that's why we are really um, highly motivated and delighted to have been able to bring this uh, therapy to patients. Let's take a break and then we're back with our interview with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, 
Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Youngest in Brief. Did you know that generic drugs are just as safe and effective as brand name drugs? Generics might look different, but they work the same way. And they can even save you money. Don't believe me? Ask your doctor or pharmacist. Or visit FDA.gov slash generic drugs. Each day, researchers make new discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Some days they take small steps. Others, huge discoveries lead to giant leaps forward. This progress, both small steps and giant leaps, happens with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are a fundamental path to progress and the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Clinical trials introduce new hope in addition to the current standard of care by allowing researchers to provide participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. So if you're interested in exploring new treatment options while helping to light the path for other patients, clinical trials may be the best choice for you. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more about clinical trials. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hovland, and this is the Young in Brief. So p- patients with relapsed or refractory DLBCL who cannot undergo autologous stem cell transplants um, currently do not have um, very great uh, treatment options. And prior to the approval of um, Monjuvi, there was no FDA-approved uh, treatment for this particular group of patients. So the, the unmet need, as you say, was therefore uh, extremely high. And that's why this approval represents really a new paradigm, I would say, for patients with this uh, form of relapsed refractory uh, DLBCL, because before this approval, uh, there was um, nothing really, there was, there was nothing approved um, by FDA. So I don't know, um, Peter, if, Peter Langmore, if you want to, if you want to add uh, to this, but these are my immediate, uh, these are my immediate thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think you asked in terms of the the numbers as well. I mean, I think we're, um, you know, we look at in the U.S. for example, about thirty thousand patients that require frontline treatment for for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and of those, maybe about a third of them end up going on to need further treatment after that. So. Um, we're looking at a you know, fairly substantial number of patients where there's this high unmet need, and as Malta said, really for a life-threatening condition. Now, um, just to just to make sure that uh, we're talking about the same thing, Monjuvi is actually the drug that we were talking about, that is Tafacitamab. I mean, that's the the, the World Health Organization's yep. name. So that that when we talk about the the the, the drug that we actually uh, uh, that people understand, where we're talking about the same thing. So you mentioned about a third of of patients. Uh, probably in, in the United States, about roughly 10,000 people, if I calculate it real quick, on an annual basis, and they need to have further treatment. They're going to be in a phase of relapse or refractory disease. What does that mean for them? I mean, I think now with the um, approval of tafacitumab in the U.S., it gives them a, another option um, for therapy and, and one that where we have a you know substantial number of patients uh, having complete response and durable response. So it gives them potentially effective option for a long-term um, efficacy. You know, there are a number of agents that are, are currently used in diffuse large B cell lymphoma and a number of others being tested. But this is the, you know, first agent that's been approved for the second-line treatment of, of adults with relapsed or refractory um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the U.S. So um, it's really meeting a, an unmet need for patients with this very aggressive disease. I agree. And um uh, I can only uh, confirm what what Peter said correctly. Uh, I think the the exciting um, data that led uh, to the to the approval and that convinced FDA that this was a was an important uh, treatment was, as uh, Peter correctly said, the high number of 
uh, patients who achieved a complete response, which means that the tumor goes away completely, and the durability of uh, these response these responses. So that's really the the new part of the new aspect here. In, in the label, in the data that we submitted to FDA, the median duration of response was 21.7 months. But we have now longer term data with a longer um, observation uh, time and the median duration of response um, is now uh, 34.6 months. That's almost three years. So that's, uh, that's really um, uh, a very strong data point uh, that ensures uh, that people who uh, respond with a complete response to this treatment uh, potentially stay on this uh, drug for a very long time. Yeah, now you, you're talking about the long the duration of, 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 of the drug, I mean, the effectiveness of the drug. One of the other measurements, of course, um, in, that is not necessarily a technical measurement, but it is definitely very important for patients is quality of life. Uh, so health-related quality of life, relatively subjective in, in many cases, but how does the disease, uh, for example, um, affect the quality of life? And, and how does the drug, the, the tafacitumab, um, actually help in, in restoring that quality of life? Yeah, so, so maybe we, we speak a bit about the disease before. Um, so, so if a patient is diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, the, the disease is uh, characterized by very rapidly growing uh, masses of B cells in the lymph nodes, in the spleen, in the liver, in the bone marrow. And what the patients feel is that they have enlarged lymph, lymph nodes in the neck, in the underarm, in the groin, or in the stomach. Patients um, describe fever, night sweats, dream tiredness, weight loss, or skin rash. So uh, patients are really, really ill. When, when you institute uh, treatment, in you know front line, but in our case in second line or higher, these symptoms go away very rapidly. The tumor masses shrink, and all these um, so-called constitutional symptoms that I described disappear. And patients are able to lead a much more normal life than they um, than they were before. So that means. A major improvement in the quality of life. Of course, I can imagine, I mean, in the de description of the disease that you just mentioned, this is very uncomfortable, uh, painful to some extent, I guess. Uh, but if, if, if people are being treated and they respond well, then, then their quality of life is to some extent restored. That's correct. I, I think that's a correct statement. Yes. Now, um, we, we t touched on the fact that... Um, about a third of the patients are not responding to treatment or are not responding well to treatment. What is, is, is the potential reason why they, is that the drugs, is that what, what, what is the reason why they don't respond well to treatment in the initial phase? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, the scientific answer is not 100%, um, it's not 100% uh, clear. We know that uh, tumors, and that's that's true probably for every uh, for every cancer type, uh, have abilities to prevent a treatment from working, and different mechanisms uh, exist. And so, in this case, in the in the lymphoma um, in the in the lymphoma case, um, it's not 100% uh, clear what turns the switch from responding to a treatment into not responding to a treatment. There are a couple of mechanisms that are currently being studied, such as uh, expression of different molecules on the surface of uh, tumor cells or deregulated proliferation pathways inside of the tumor cells. But there's, there's not one uh, size fits all answer that, um, that I'm able to give you to explain why a tumor stops responding uh, to treatment. Peter Langmore, I don't know, you're also very active in the translational um, field in, in uh, cancer. I don't know, do you have any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, that's the, I, I don't have much to add. I mean, people have mm -hmm. done a lot of work looking at uh, genetic um, abnormalities in, in uh, lymphomas, and, and some of those seem to 
uh, increase the chance that you will respond or not respond to uh, to various therapies. But you know, the bottom line is we don't know, and and it's difficult to predict um, sometimes who's going to respond and who doesn't. You know, the the unfortunate reality is that you know a substantial number of patients you know will not respond or will relapse um, after what uh, can otherwise be a fairly effective therapy, and that's why you know there's a need for uh, more effective therapies that can be given to patients um, tolerably in later lines of therapy. Yeah. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the lines of therapy that are available right now. If you, you look at the current standard of therapy for the treatment, what, what would be that? What, what, is, what is the current standard of treatment? So the, the first line of treatment is immunochemotherapy uh, consisting of rituximab, an antibody directed against uh, CD20, in conjunction with a chemotherapy cocktail consisting of four different agents, which is called uh, which is called CHOP, CHOP. So this um, the first line of treatment is called RCHOP, and as Peter uh, Peter correctly uh, described, um, roughly um, I would say 50 to 60 percent um, of patients are cured with this initial uh, treatment, but about um, 40% or so of patients uh, uh, either don't respond or relapse after the, the after the after the first initial response. Now, now when you mention the word cured, that means that they are completely cured in the sense of what no no evidence of disease. Um, is, is that what you refer to in in that in that first part of the is it 50 to 60 yes. percent of the people that you mentioned? Yes. That's correct. So then, then the remaining patients, right, they are refractory or re, re, relapse. Uh, that is basically where we're now going to concentrate on, the people that really are seeing their disease come back. Correct. Yep. Let's take a break. And then we're back with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. Over the years, you've brought opioids into your home. They helped when you were in pain, and you held on to them just in case. But holding on to opioids puts your family at risk. Learn more at www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. Sarcoma. Odds are you've never heard that word before. But for the 40 people diagnosed with sarcoma every day, it is a life-changing word. Life-changing and devastating because sarcoma is cancer. Sarcoma is a cancer of bone and soft tissue more prevalent in children than in adults. More than 6,000 people lose their lives to sarcoma each year. Treatment options for sarcoma are limited, and new therapies are desperately needed. More research and increased awareness is necessary to find a cure for a cancer that you probably didn't even know existed until now. Through awareness, advocacy, and research, the Sarcoma Foundation of America is determined to help those affected by this forgotten cancer, to bring hope to the children and adults whose lives are forever changed by a word they had never heard before. Please help us in the fight to find the cure for sarcoma. For more information on sarcoma and the work of the Sarcoma Foundation of America, please go to curesarcoma.org. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin. If you're just joining us, this week I'm talking with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. Now, when you, when you describe that, it, 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 that, that group of patients, does that mean that the second time that they get a the treatment, um, they may have a chance to be cured? Or, or is that a kind of a condition that, that really needs a different approach to treatment? So, so far, the treatment in second line or higher has not um, elicited cures. So that's an area of act, very active uh, clinical uh, research. And I think what I alluded to earlier, the, the long durability of responses, which approaches now three years, would suggest that um, patients can benefit from, from a treatment for a very long time. If this, if this is going to 
be able to cure patients, we don't know at this moment, but I would say it's a very important step into long-term responses of patients who otherwise would progress quite rapidly. So that is, in, in, in essence, is good, is good news, right? It, it compares to, I mean, so people are not cured in first line or the first treatment options, but then uh, with the drug that you have available for, for treatment options in second line, the opportunity for patients to be cured uh, or at least to be in remission for, for a long time, I mean, you mentioned three years, uh, it's there. It's, it's, it's some of the things that, that potentially may even go longer. That's correct. And, the, you know, since the, the, the drug has um, only just achieved um, approval, the data that we collect in our ongoing studies is still maturing. So uh, you're, you're fully correct um, in, say, in saying that, um, you know, possibly longer observation times um, may yield uh, interesting additional information that could point to how long patients could actually benefit from this treatment. Right. Now, talking about, about the, the approval, talking about uh, the, the, the trial that you've sponsored, it's a phase two trial called Elmind. Uh, tell me a little bit about that particular trial. Who qualifies to be part of that? Uh, what are some of the results that you've seen? Potentially, if patients or physicians hear about this trial, is there still an opportunity to participate in that trial? So Elmind was uh, designed as a study um, of a combination of uh, tafacitamab or Monjuvi um, with uh, lenalidomide. So it was a combination a treatment of two drugs. And patients uh, had to have previously been treated with the so-called frontline treatment consisting of the RCHOP regimen that I, des that I described uh, earlier. And uh, patients uh, had to have between one and um, a higher number of uh, prior treatments. So in our trial, half of the patients had received only one prior line of treatment, and the other half of patients received uh, two lines or more. Um, and that particular composition of the patient population um, convinced FDA to grant approval in second line patients and those patients with higher lines of uh, prior treatments. And if patients or physicians um, hear about this trial, um, is there a potential for them to still participate? Is it an ongoing trial? Uh, because I understand the approval that you have is what we call an accelerated approval um, that requires you to to submit additional data in, 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 in the near future. Um, what kind of options are there? So um, the trial uh, has been closed to enrollment. Uh, so the trial is um, fully uh, enrolled and no patients uh, can come on the study. But since um, Monjuvi or Tafacitamab in combination with lenalidomide is now uh, commercially available in the United States, um, theoretically every patient in the United States has a chance to achieve, to receive this uh, treatment if he or she uh, goes to a hospital or to a doctor. Right. So it is it is open and available for, for patients that, that really need this, to have that unmet medical need. Yes, we, we were able to provide the, the drug five days after the approval um, in the United States. And the drug is available for treatment today for any patient who is suffering from from this uh, DLBCL disease um, in second line or higher uh, situations. Right. And, and are there particular clinical trials in addition to the commercially available product? Um, are there clinical trials ongoing uh, in which you do additional studies uh, to, to expand the, the approval? Um, yes, we have additional studies ongoing. We have um, a study ongoing in um, frontline uh, DLBCL in untreated uh, patients because we want to find out if tafacitamab in combination with uh, lenalidomide um, also would provide an option um, for patients who are untreated, yeah, who are 
um, who have not received any prior uh, treatment um, before. So that study um, uh, is ongoing in the United uh, States and um, uh, Morphosis in collaboration with Insight is about to start um, a larger study in frontline DLBCL, which is um, starting at the beginning of uh, next year. So there is definitely um, in, in more opportunity in that respect. And that's, of course, as is, is, you mentioned, frontline therapy that would replace the current standard of care if it's approved and if it's functioning. It would, uh, it would add on to the current uh, standard of care. So the, the idea is um, in that study to add tafatitamab and lenalidomide to the established RCHOP uh, treatment. That would be the, that would be the, the idea. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, the national um, can, can, what is it, the organization that actually um, approves or works with a lot of different hospitals, the NCCN, um, they have included this particular treatment um, in, in their recommendations. How, how important is that for you? That's very important um, because the NCCN guidelines are very uh, important guidelines for every doctor um, in the United uh, States. So um, it is a, it's basically a handbook of um, wh what to do with um, and how to treat patients with um, certain diseases. So uh, it's, a very, uh, it's a very important um, clinical practice guideline in oncology, and we are very um, satisfied uh, to know and to have found out that the NCCN acted so quickly to include uh, Monjuvi in combination with lenalidomide um, in, the, in the guidelines. Right. And that means that, that what you said is a kind of a guideline. And so doctors have then the opportunity to, to look at their patient, uh, their patient's specific needs um, and, and what is the potentially the best treatment options available. Yes, that's correct. So just one word on the NCCN. It's a, it's a non-for-profit uh, alliance of, um, I think, around 30 or so um, leading cancer centers in the United uh, States. And the um, NCCN guidelines are there to assist uh, decision-making um, uh, for physicians, uh, but also nurses, pharmacists, uh, payers, um, basically everybody, uh, with, the, with the goal to synchronize and to improve uh, patient care and outcome. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very powerful and very uh, well-respected alliance. Let's take a break. And then we're back with our interview with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is encouraging cancer patients and survivors to be extra cautious during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cancer treatment, especially chemotherapy, weakens the immune system, making you at higher risk of severe illness. Dr. Lisa Richardson is director of the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. Take these steps to stay healthy. Wash your hands often with soap and water. Clean and disinfect frequently touch surfaces daily. Stay home. If you must leave, keep at least six feet between you and others. Avoid touching your face, eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. If your temperature is 100.4 or higher, call your doctor. Use CDC's coronavirus self-checker to help you make decisions about seeking medical care. Make sure your caregivers and household members are aware of your higher risk and take precautions. Visit cdc.gov backslash coronavirus and preventcancerinfections.org for more health tips. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin.
If you're just joining us, this week I'm talking with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President of Oncology Drug Development at Insight. Now, so far, we've been uh, talking a little bit about uh, what happens here in the United States. Are you, with this particular drug, um, looking at markets outside the United States? Um, I can Im- only imagine that what we see here in the United States might be replicated in Europe, for example. Um, are you pursuing that opportunity in terms of regulatory approval? Peter Langmo, do you want to, do you want to take that? Yeah. So we currently um, have, uh, we've uh, submitted the data uh, for review by the European Medicine Agency, so in the European Union, and that's currently under review. They've uh, validated the submission at this point, and so we're in uh, in discussions with them. And so that's our, our next step for trying to get approval um, for tafacitumab in different markets. Right. So, I mean, and, and is, do you have an indication when, for example, the European Medical Evaluation Authorities uh, may... may, may um look at, at some of your drugs in terms of making it available to patients? Uh, again, the, the drug is currently under review and, uh, you know, hopefully if, if we get the drug approved, then we'll make it available to patients as quickly as possible after that. You don't, you don't have a clear timeline yet in terms of what the, the, the medical authorities in Europe would do? We don't have a, fi- a fixed date yet, no. So now one of the things is that I have both of you here on the phone, uh, two different companies, um, Morphosis and, and, and Insight. There's a reason for that because you both are working with this particular drug. Um, early this year, uh, uh, the, the two companies entered into a collaboration and license agreement to further develop uh, the, the drug. Tell me a little bit more about that, that relationship that you're building. Yeah, so, do we just start? I can. Uh, I mean, so, so as you say, we we entered into the collaboration back in uh, January of this year. Um, it's both for uh, collaborating on clinical development as well as the commercialization. So, in the United States, the drug will be co-commercialized by both uh, Morphosis and by Insight. And uh, from a development standpoint, we're also sharing the development responsibilities as well. So we collaborate very closely now on um, the future development activities for the compound. We work very closely on all the um, future regulatory submissions that we'll have. So it's, uh, we think it'll be a very good partnership. Obviously, it's gotten off to a very good start. Um, we were very enthusiastic at Insight to you know, join with Morphosis in this because of the data we've seen with tafacitumab from the Elmine study um, that it looked very encouraging. And so we were very eager to join in this um, collaboration. So, you know, Malta, you want to make any additional comments? Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Peter. I can only second that um, from, from day one. Um, the, the interaction between the two companies was um, very positive. I think both companies share the passion for science and for helping patients as quickly as possible. Uh, I think we took some educated risk here um, of submitting a relatively small single arm uncontrolled study um, for um, foreign approval and um, Insight and Morphosis both shared the passion of um, uh, going into novel um, paths of um, discussing with the regulatory agencies um, and I think the success of the approval uh, is a testament to, um, to that desire. So I think both companies are driven really by um, by uh, science, scientific um, knowledge, passion to bring drugs to patients as quickly as possible, and um, to go um, as broad as we possibly can to make uh, this drug available to as many patients as possible. So I think from my perspective, this is the, the best of all worlds, um, uh, combi- collaborating with, uh, with Insight. Well, that, sound, that sounds very uh, interesting. It's like, I mean, there are potentials, uh, of course, for additional drug development. Um, so are we uh, looking from the outside in? Does this partnership that you were just building help or may ultimately lead to additional treatment options uh, for patients with this particular disease? I think we hope so. I mean, Malta spoke to some of the studies we have ongoing, and we're in discussions around future areas that we may want to look at developing the drug. I think the advantage is it, is it uh, essentially pools um, the resources and the, and the thought and the expertise from the two companies to look for the uh, maximum opportunities we have for developing tafacitumab in, in different parts of the world. So 
as I say, I, I'm I'm hopeful that it will continue to be a very uh, productive and and, and uh, good collaboration that will ultimately benefit patients around the world. So, I mean, if I sum it up as um, a potential to uh, to see more things in, in the very near future uh, with additional treatment options, uh, not beyond to uh, this particular drug, uh, all around the world, that is definitely uh, something that you can respond to. I, mean, I think that's our goal. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. Again, what I said, I'm looking forward to uh, the potential what you are bringing uh, to patients uh, to make sure that patients are definitely having a better chance in, in surviving or definitely better quality of life in this particular disease area, uh, potentially also in different disease areas within oncology. Um, and and th again, thanks very much for your time this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for the, thanks for the opportunity. In today's edition of the Oncogene Brief, I spoke with Malte Peters, Chief Research and Development Officer at Morphosis, and Peter Langmuir, Vice President Oncology Drug Development at Insight, about transformative therapies being developed for patients diagnosed with relapsed or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, including a new drug called Tavacitumab. Tavacitumab, which is branded as Monjuvi, is commercially available in the United States and co-marketed by Morphosis and Insight. The companies are committed to supporting patients throughout their treatment journey and are working together to help lower patient access barriers. As part of this commitment, the companies have launched My Mission Support, a robust patient support program offering financial assistance, ongoing education, and other resources for patients who are prescribed tafacitamab in the United States. For more information about this program, visit their website, mymissionsupport.com. For us here at the Oncogene Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX Public Radio Exchange and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes and Spotify. For more information about supporting the Oncogene Brief, go to oncogene at oncogene.com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening, and join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine-related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.